I want to begin by telling you that there are two men in the New Testament who are both Baptists. Did you know that? They were cousins to each other. One is called John the Baptist and the other is called Jesus the Baptist. I wonder if you could find the verse that tells us that. Actually, it's not a noun. They're called the baptizer, not the Baptist. So we have John the baptizer and Jesus the baptizer. And they offer two very different baptisms, both of which every Christian needs. It's interesting that John said, I come baptizing you in water, but there's someone coming after me who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And those are the two baptisms we want to talk about. I talked about the one last time in water, but this time I want to talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit by Jesus himself. You can be baptized in water by anyone, even by someone who has been baptized. Jesus was. John the Baptist said, I need to be baptized by you, not, not you. But Jesus said, it's all right, we are to do everything that's right. And so I need to be baptized. Which, by the way, takes an excuse from anybody who says, I don't need to be. If Jesus needed to be, then we do. It's as simple as that. The one person who had nothing to wash away was Jesus himself. But he still submitted to it. Now, I told you last time that the verb baptize means to plunge a solid entirely in a liquid. It was used in the ancient Greek world of dyeing wool in a whole bowl full of liquid or dipping a cup into a bowl of punch or wine and you dip the whole cup in to get it full or it was used of a ship that was sunk in the bottom of the ocean. With us, I'm afraid, if we hear of a ship being baptized, we think of a bottle of wine broken over its bows and God bless all who sail in her. But no, the Greek word means to be sunk right under. And it was a nickname applied to John and he applied it to Jesus. John the plunger, John the dipper, John the immerser, these would all be the modern equivalent in English. But it was John who said, there's somebody coming after me who will plunge you into the Holy Spirit, who will take you right under and soak you in the Holy Spirit. And that's mentioned at the beginning of every one of the four Gospels. It's mentioned at the beginning of Acts. It's mentioned in Corinthians and one or two other places too. Now a baptism consists of two things, in and out, down and up. You go down into the water and you come up out of the water. And so there are two Greek words that are applied to every baptism. One is the little word en, E-N, from which we get the word entrance or going in. And the other is the little two-letter word EX, X, from which we get exit or going out. And it's interesting that both these two little words are applied to the baptisms, in, out. And it's interesting that in John chapter 3, verse 5, where Jesus is putting Nicodemus right in his theology, Jesus uses the out. And when he's puzzled, is Nicodemus, as to what it means to be born again, Jesus says, to be born again is to be born out of water and spirit. And I'm afraid the word out there is rarely translated. But Jesus used the X, E-X, born out of water and spirit, which means that somebody was first put into water and spirit and I reckon the phrase, born out of water and spirit, is a reference to the two baptisms that every Christian needs and which come from John and Jesus. 
So that's a little clue. You may have been puzzled by it, that phrase, born out of water. Well, I think it means water, quite simply. And it's a reference to water <laughs> baptism. As born out of spirit is a reference to spirit baptism. One refers to the medium in which you're baptized, and the other refers to the necessary raising afterwards. So there's an in and an out in baptism. And uh, in the Greek it's very obvious when you read it that Jesus said it's coming out of water and, bap and spirit. And that is being born again. Now that may be news to you. Well now this phrase, baptized in the Holy Spirit, comes from John. And he's drawing a parallel with his own baptism in and out of water to the baptism in the spirit in and out of being plunged into the spirit and therefore it's a total experience obviously now when we study the language they used about baptism in the spirit we learn a whole lot more it's such a rich vocabulary it's a rich experience and so a whole lot of different words are used, verbs and nouns. Let's look at some of them. First, there are a lot of liquid words used. And the Holy Spirit is often referred to as a liquid, as living water, as uh, something that is poured out on you. And so there are liquid words about baptism in the Holy Spirit which draw a parallel. There are also some words like come upon or fall upon. The Spirit coming on people and falling on people. And then there are words like filled with. And that is used as an alternative for baptism in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now God has given each of us an overflow. If you want to know where it is, put the finger on the nose and just go down a bit and about an inch below your nose, you'll find your overflow. And whatever your heart is full of will overflow there. That's how you know when your tank of petrol is full on your car. Nowadays the pump shuts off automatically. But I can remember the days when <laughs> your petrol gushed out and you knew the tank was full. When you know a person is full of something, you know it because it comes out of their mouth. If a person is full of fun and humour, they laugh. If they're full of fear, they cry out. If they're full of anger, they shout. Whatever the heart is full of comes out of the mouth. Jesus said that. And if the heart is full of dirty things, that will come out of the mouth sooner or later. And when the heart is full of the Holy Spirit, filled to overflowing, something is going to come out of the mouth. And that is the usual thing in the New Testament that we notice. When they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, something came out of the mouth. It wasn't always the same thing. What it usually was, was a totally unknown language. I hate the word tongues. It sounds like babbling, babbling or something. But it isn't, it's, it's languages. And God speaks at least 1600 languages, which is how many languages there are on earth. And God can speak them all. And he can listen to them all. And he knows them all. And therefore, one of the things that can come out of your mouth when you're filled with the Holy Spirit is a language you never learned. I'll t give you some examples of that later. But that's why the gift of tongues, or rather the gift of languages, is so often mentioned as the proof that someone's been filled with the Spirit of God. And it should come as no surprise to you that you can speak a language you never learned, which God knows, and when God has the whole of you, and especially your tongue, you can expect him to prove it by giving you one of the other languages he knows. 
but it will be a real language and not babbling. One preacher I know in, in England has been teaching people to say banana backwards. And when they do, he says, you've now got a tongue. That's rubbish, actually. And yet, he is doing something helpful, as I will show you later. One of the real barriers to people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is a cultural barrier due to our Britishness. We are so British that we don't like the thought of speaking what we don't know we're saying. And we hold back. And many people who speak in tongues or speak in the language of God doubt whether it is a language. I spent some time in Hong Kong with Jackie Pullinger. I was in the walled city with her, which was the most dreadful place, full of rats and thieves and disease of every kind. And it was the one bit of Hong Kong that wasn't under law. And therefore all the criminals lived in that horrible place. And right in the middle of it, Jackie Pullinger had a, a room which she rented and which she used to win people for Christ. It was the worst place I think I've ever been in. But she was telling me that she prayed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and she opened her mouth and a language came out but she could not believe it was a real language. It sounded like rubbish. So she did a very wise and helpful thing. She decided for 15 minutes every day to use this language for one month. And if nothing was any different after one month, she would give it up. But within the month, she was seeing miracles and things were happening which she'd never realized before. And she realized it was a real language. A friend of mine in uh, Los Angeles, in Orange County, is a pastor of a Pentecostal church. And he had this gift of language and used it frequently. And he met once a month with all the pastors and ministers and clergy of the area. And they all knew that he used this unusual gift. And they were puzzled. And so they, they asked him to give a paper on it to the ministers and the clergy, to read a paper. That's what they love to do, listen to papers being read. It doesn't do much good, but they, they like it. And so my friend Ralph prepared a paper for them. But before the day came to give it, there was a Methodist minister nearby. And one morning this Methodist minister rang his doorbell. And he invited him in and said, what can I do to help you? And the Methodist minister said, I want that gift that you've got. I want the gift of a new language to use in prayer and praise. And so Ralph said, well, kneel down on the carpet. And he knelt down. Ralph put both hands on his head and prayed that he might have the gift of a new language. And the Methodist minister opened his mouth and said, Abby Dabby, Abby Dabby. And Ralph thought, that's not much of a language. He said, I'll pray some more. Just keep on just resting in the Lord and I'll pray some more. And he, he said again, Abby Dabby, Abby Dabby. And he never said anything else. And Ralph just didn't believe he'd got a gift of a new language. And the minister, the Methodist minister, heard that Ralph was going to give a paper on tongues at the minister's fraternal. And he said, oh, I've got to be there. He said, we've got to be there. And Ralph thought, help. If that man opens his mouth and says, Abby Dabby, by this time it become his nickname. Everybody said, there's Abby Dabby going down the road. And Ralph was dreading him saying this in front of the other pastors. And he said, now look, he said, it's me they've asked to give the papers. So he said, you just sit at the back and pray for me. He said, don't, just leave, leave it to me to talk about it. 
But on the day itself, as soon as Ralph had finished his paper, he tried to hang it out for the whole hour. But as soon as he finished up, jumps the Methodist minister and says, Brethren, he says, God has given me this lovely gift. And he said, he's telling me to exercise it now so that you know what it's like. And he opened his mouth and he said, Abbe Dabbe, Abbe Dabbe, Abbe Dabbe. Well, there was a stunned silence. And Ralph couldn't wait to get home. He, he got out of the meeting as quickly as possible and went home. And uh, the very next morning, an Episcopalian, that's an Anglican over there, was knocking at Ralph's door. And he said, Ralph, can I come in and talk to you? Ralph said, yes, come on in. Now, what do you want to talk about? He said, I want that gift you were talking about yesterday. And Ralph said, I'm, I'm astonished. After that outburst from that Methodist minister, you're still interested. He said, oh, it's not because of you. It's because of him that I'm here. And Ralph said, because of him? What was impressive about that? And the Episcopalian said, look, that man is a doctor five times over from the university. He's got a brilliant brain. He could do better than that if he was inventing it. He said, it's because of him, I want that gift. And so Ralph prayed for him. Now months later, Ralph was in Africa, in the heart of the jungle, in a little African village. And he was walking through the village and a voice behind him said, Abi Dabi, Abi Dabi. And his first thought was, what on earth is that Methodist minister from Los Angeles doing in the middle of Africa? And he turned around and he was looking into the face of an elderly African. And the Lord rebuked Ralph and said, Ralph, you didn't think this was a language. Now you know it is. But Ralph said, why did you only give him just two words? And the Lord said to Ralph, because he's so clever that I had to make him like a little child. And he was childlike enough to say, that's my language. And dear Ralph couldn't wait to get home. And as soon as he got back to Los Angeles, he went straight to the Methodist minister. And he said, brother, please forgive me. I have never believed you had the gift of language. But he said, now the Lord has rebuked me in the middle of Africa. And I've come to say sorry. So there can be doubts about the language because when you don't know a language and find yourself saying something, of course your brain says, what on earth are you talking about? But it could be a language. The difference is, of course, between babbling and a language is that a language has structure, syntax. It's put together properly. And I know someone else who recorded various tongues that he'd heard, and he submitted them to a linguist and said, are all these languages or not? And the linguist came back and said, no, they're not all proper languages, but some of them are, and I'll tell you which are real. I don't know why I've said so much about that, but I'll come back to it later. Filled with is a very common way of referring to baptism in the Spirit because that's what's happening. You're filled to overflowing. And I remember talking to a missionary in Brasilia, in the capital of Brazil, and we were sitting in a public park having a picnic. And a lot of families were all around us, each with picnics and eating away. And I was talking to this missionary, a lovely British man, reserved, controlled, a real public schoolboy. But he devoted his life to missionary work in Brazil. And he said, David, he said, I've longed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But he said, I've dedicated all the natural gifts I've got to the Lord. I've served him faithfully for years. But he said, I don't have any supernatural power. And we talked for a while. And then I just quietly said, 
would you let me lay hands on you and pray for you? And he did. And there he was, this quiet Englishman. And as soon as I did that, he shouted, Hallelujah! With as loud a voice, it rang around the whole park. Everybody turned around and looked at us. And I sort of turned away <laughs> and tried to disassociate myself from him, but it was no good. I had to acknowledge. Do you know that within 24 hours, he had healed two sick people? Just with a word. He'd never known that before. He'd dedicated all his natural gifts to the Lord. He'd done his best to serve the Lord. He'd been so conscientious. But he hadn't got the power. And he knew it. Now he didn't speak in a language. He just praised the Lord. I said to him, you've never done that before in public, have you? He said, no fear. He said, I'm English. I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing. But he was just caught up in praise to the Lord. So filled with his common. Now the one difference between baptized in Holy Spirit and filled with Holy Spirit is that filled is repeated in Scripture. Your baptism in the Spirit is never repeated. It's an initiation. It's an introduction to the Spirit. But being filled, why in Acts 2 they were filled, in Acts 4 they were filled again. And in Ephesians 5.18, Paul tells people to go on being filled with the Spirit. And interestingly, he says, when you are, you'll find yourself singing and singing to other believers. So the filling is repeated. The verb baptized is not repeated. It's kept for the first step, the first initiation. But there's one word that they all used for this event, and it's the verb receive. And whenever a New Testament apostle mentions the word receive, he is referring to his baptism in the Holy Spirit, referring above all to the day of Pentecost, when 120 of them received the Holy Spirit, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was among those who were praying between the resurrection and the day of Pentecost. And so when I'm speaking to Roman Catholics, I love to tell them that Mary was a charismatic and that she spoke in tongues. I've never heard a preacher say that, except me. <laughs> but it has struck people very much. When I'm talking to the Welsh, I love to tell them of St. David's baptism in the Holy Spirit. March the 1st, St. David's Day, is supposed to wear a daffodil or a leek. And that's the big day for the Welsh. But St. David was the Bishop of Wales having been a slave boy. He went over to Ireland, came back to Wales to be the bishop. And when he was ordained a bishop, he wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so he set off on pilgrimage to Jerusalem with a number of other monks who accompanied him. Now they had to walk in those days to Jerusalem. No flights in four hours. They walked for weeks. And they got as far as Lyon, halfway through France, or what was then called Gaul. And the monks were keeping a diary of the journey. And I have read that diary. And it says, Ye Holy Father David came to Gaul. And there ye Holy Father was baptized in ye Holy Spirit as in ye days of ye apostles. And he spake in other tongues as in the days of ye apostles. And I love telling the Welsh that because they have no idea that the Bishop of Wales, St. David, was a Pentecostal. <laughs> At least he knew what they knew in Pentecost. 
and so receive. Now, the apostles used that word when they were questioning people, when they were checking them. For example, when Paul came to Ephesus, he found a group of disciples. They're called disciples, though they'd only just begun the discipleship. And he was puzzled. There was something missing from them. And so he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now that tells us a number of things. You can receive the Holy Spirit at the same time as you believe, or you cannot. And I want to underline this very strongly this afternoon. You can believe in Jesus and not receive the Holy Spirit. And that's a very needy situation. And Paul had missed something from them. They were talking about the Bible, the scriptures. They had been baptized, though only with John's baptism. But there was something missing. And he knew it was the Holy Spirit. And so he asked them, did you receive Holy Spirit when you believed? or as some translations put it, since you believed. Doesn't matter, it can mean either. Did you receive the Spirit when you believed or since you believed? He's asking them a very important question, which one New Testament scholar called William Barclay has said every member of a church needs to be asked this question. Because it is possible to believe without receiving. That comes as a shock to people. But they weren't the only ones to do that. If you turn back to Acts 8, where Philip went to Samaria to preach the gospel and had a great time, they repented, they believed, they were baptized. But, and there was the big but, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. And so Peter and John came hurrying down from Jerusalem to put this right. And sure enough, when they laid hands and prayed for them, they received. Now ask yourself two very important questions. Question number one, how did anyone know that they had not received? There must have been some clear indication that they had not, that Philip knew and reported to the apostles back in Jerusalem. Now, when you look at what had happened in Samaria, that was a successful crusade, wasn't it? The whole city of Samaria repented. They all believed the gospel. They all were baptized. And it says there were, the city was full of joy. Now, if that happened at a Billy Graham crusade, they would say, that was a successful crusade. But they didn't say that in those days because they noticed they didn't receive. What did they expect? And then the second question you need to ask about that event is this. How did anyone know when they did receive? Because they all knew so definitely that one of them, a conjurer, a professional magician, called Simon, said, I would like that power. I would like to be able to do that to people. And he offered money to Peter for the secret of the trick. And Peter said, to hell with you and your money. You need to repent. Because you can't buy spiritual things. You can't purchase them. So these are important questions. How did anybody know when someone hadn't received the Spirit? And how did anyone know when someone had? To put it crudely, to be baptized in the Spirit is such a definite event that not only will you know it, but everybody else present will also know it. Now that seems to me as clear as possible. 
However, it does raise a question. When people have repented, believed, and been baptized, and still haven't received, what is their relationship to the Holy Spirit? Surely the Holy Spirit was helping them to repent and believe? Well, my answer to that is that for the first disciples, Pentecost was a change in the relationship with the Holy Spirit. It changed from what Jesus said, He has been with you, He will be in you. And that's a very important change of preposition. I was a minister of the Gospel before I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I preached and the Lord blessed and used that. I became known as a Bible teacher. But I didn't know the Holy Spirit. And therefore for me, one Sunday in the year was very difficult indeed. Pentecost Sunday. When I had to preach on the Holy Spirit and produce two sermons, not one. And I used to dread that Sunday coming. But I could usually, I've got enough books on the Holy Spirit on my shelf, I could usually read up enough to get by with two sermons. And I was jolly glad to get back to the Gospel the next week and preach about the Father and the Son, which tells you where I was. And therefore I couldn't help the people get to know the third person of the Trinity. I'm going to go on with my testimony because it's important to me and it may help someone here. I preached faithfully on Pentecost Sunday on the Holy Spirit once a year because I had to. And then it was all over, thank goodness, for another year. And I thought, I, this is dishonest. How can I, a preacher of the Word of God, steer carefully away from the Holy Spirit. And I've since sat under other ministries that do the same. And uh, I crin cringe when it happens. And I know that we're not going to deal with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday, which is a tragedy. Well, I made a decision. I decided to preach my way right through the Bible and cover every text on the Holy Spirit and in this way force myself to face the whole truth of the third person of the Trinity. And I began the series, started in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God moving on the water, causing the dry land to appear at creation. And then I moved on and found people like Samson, tremendously strong. No, he wasn't. He was weak as a kitten. It was only when the Spirit of the Lord came on him that his strength was able to do incredible things. And there were others. I found that everybody who said anything particular or who did anything particular or who was anything particular in the Old Testament owed it to the Holy Spirit. And I produced some good sermons on the Spirit in the Old Testament. But I was getting nearer and nearer to Acts 2, and I thought, what am I going to say about that? And I dreaded that coming. In fact, having started the series of 20 sermons, I thought, how can I stop it before the end? Well, something happened before I got as far as Acts 2. There was a man in the church called James, Jimmy, and he was the self-appointed leader of the opposition. Do you know what I mean? There's one in every church who sees their calling in God to correct the pastor and to put him right. And dear James had a brilliant brain. He was in charge of a patent office in London, a very clever chap. And I used to come home from a church meeting and say to my wife, oh, dear mate James, again. And she would say, look, 
the other members are all with you. Don't worry about one member who's against anything you suggest. And he had two reasons to oppose anything I suggested. One, we've never done that before. We're not going to try. And two, we did it before and it didn't work. And so those two things flattened every new suggestion. Now, I did get relief from James. Once a year, he developed hay fever of a really bad kind and was simply out for the count. And he had to go to bed for up to six weeks. And uh, I got relief from James for six weeks. And we can push things through quickly without him. And just when I got to Matthew's Gospel in my series on the Holy Spirit, he went down with his hay fever. And his lungs filled up with liquid. And he would lie in bed looking grey and really washed out. And I thought, I must go and see him. But when I went, I had no intention, whatever, of doing anything other than telling him the news and praying with him and maybe reading the Bible to him. But all the way there, on a Sunday afternoon, I kept hearing James 5. James 5. And I thought, well, his name is James, but what's the five? And then I remembered that in the letter of James in the New Testament, chapter five says, is any among you sick? Let him call the elders and let them lay hands on him and he will be healed. So when I got to his bedroom and he lay there without even a pillow, just flat on his back and uh, his first question to me was, what do you think about James 5? And I said, well, actually, I have been thinking about it. He said, will you come and do that to me? Which I had never done before. And I said, uh, why? Well, he said, I've got to go to Switzerland on Thursday on business and very important business. And he said, the doctor's put me to bed for at least three weeks, so I can't go. He said, would you come? And anoint me with oil. I said, I'll, I'll pray about it. And that's usually a cop-out when you say, I'll pray about it. And uh, I went away on the Sunday afternoon. I did pray about it, but I didn't get through to heaven. Heaven was brass. And uh, I did on the Wednesday have a phone call from his wife who said, Jimmy says, are you coming? to do it. And very reluctantly I said, I'll come tonight and I'll bring some of the leaders with me. So that afternoon I went to Boots, the chemist or whatever the chemist was called there, and bought a bottle of olive oil uh, in anticipation. And about four o'clock in the afternoon I went into the church and I knelt in the pulpit where I usually preached. Don't know why, but I went into that pulpit. And I tried to pray for Jimmy. Have you ever tried to pray for a sick person that you're glad is ill? <laughs> it's not easy to know what to say. And so I didn't really know how to pray for him. And then quite suddenly, I was pouring out my soul for him and really praying for him and wanting him better, only I was not using English. As far as I could tell, it was Chinese, or a similar language. And I remember looking at my watch and thinking, I haven't been praying for him for an hour. And then I thought, I wonder if I can do that again. And I began to pray again, but this time it was more Russian than Chinese. And I thought, boy, what's going to happen tonight when we go to Jimmy's house? And so that night I went with the elders and my bottle of olive oil to Jimmy's home. And he lay there gasping for breath. And I opened James 5 and we used it like a car handbook for servicing a car. It said, first of all, it said, confess your sins to one another. 
So I turned to James and I said, James, I've never liked you. And he said, that's mutual. <laughs> so we got all that out and a few other things too. And then I said, well, now it says anoint him with oil. So I took the bottle, took the cork out and poured it on his head. And guess what happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I said, well, Jimmy, we've done what the book says, but I can't think of anything else. And I got up and I literally began to run away to the door. And at the door, I paused and looked back and I said, Jimmy, have you still got your airline ticket for tomorrow? He said, of course. I said, I'll pick you up and run you to the airport, to Heathrow. And I ran. And I didn't sleep much that night. And I didn't dare to contact him in the morning. I couldn't face it. I thought, well, he was difficult enough before, but now he'll be terrible. I'll be nothing in his sight now. He rang me about 10 o'clock. And he said, can you run me to the airport? I said, Jimmy, are you all right? He said, yes. I said, does the doctor say you can go? Yes, he said, I, I'm fit enough to travel. He said, I've even been to have my hair cut. And the barber said, I'm afraid I'll have to give you a shampoo first. He said, I've never had such a greasy head of hair to, to cut. And he said, uh, I said, what happened? He said, in the middle of the night, it was as if two big hands squeezed my chest. And he said, I brought up half a bucket full of liquid. And my lungs were emptied of the liquid and I could breathe. And so I ran him to Heathrow Airport. Now what happened as a result? Number one, he became my best friend. And my best supporter. Number two, he and his wife both got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Three, he never had that problem again. And he'd had it every year without fail from a boy. Now, if you tell me that's the work of Satan, I can't believe you. That's the work of God, surely. And he became the secretary of the church. And when the time came for me to leave Charlford St. Peter and go to Guildford, he was the first person I went to see and tell. Well, that's what happened. The next Sunday, I was still in Matthew and the Holy Spirit in Matthew, so I didn't get to Acts 2 the next Sunday, though I now knew what to say. I now knew what had happened to them, and I could speak from knowledge. But the next Sunday, I spoke from Matthew, from notes I'd prepared over months, and a young man called Ken, a carpenter came to me after the service and he said, what happened to you this week? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean what happened to me? He said, you're different. I said, in what way? He said, this Sunday you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and yet I said nothing particular. I don't mention what had happened, but that was his verdict on my ministry. You now know what you're talking about. What a terrible thing to say. But nevertheless, it was true. And that began some extraordinary experiences. It wasn't one long list of miracles, but things began to happen and I began to have words for people. I began to believe in healing. I began to do all kinds of things not least, get really interested in Israel. The Holy Spirit taught me about Israel. And uh, if you know my ministry at all, you know that I'm always talking about God's chosen people and their future in God's plan. So that's just a little testimony. I was speaking in Colston Hall, Bristol. Do you know that? 
It's the biggest public hall in Bristol. And they asked me to speak about the Holy Spirit. And there was a lady sitting in the front row. And I said, the Lord can fill you with, your, with his spirit any time. You've got to ask him. I can't do it for you, he can. And this dear housewife suddenly, in a loud voice, spoke out in praise to God, but not in English. Now she was English and she was just an ordinary housewife, but there was um, a man from Pakistan sitting about four seats along and he leapt out of his chair and ran along to her and said, you're speaking my language. And she looked at him blankly. He said, you're speaking Urdu. He said, that's the language I was taught as a boy. That happened in the middle of my sermon in Colson Hall, Bristol. Well, I remember hearing a man in Guildford speak in perfect Hebrew. And he praised Adonai, Lord, and string of perfect Hebrew. And I'm quite sure I know the man. He was a working man. He had no knowledge of Hebrew at all. I was thrilled when a missionary told me that Africans were praising God in perfect English in the middle of the jungle. Well, I think we must get down to some brass tacks. It could be an outburst of praise. It could be an outburst of prophecy. That's mentioned in scripture. It could be a simple, loud hallelujah. But it's proof that the Holy Spirit is there. I've been asked a number of questions, all of which began with the word, words, at what point? Are you sure of your salvation? At what point do you become a Christian? At what point? And I have problems with people who want a point. The real truth is that you cannot be sure of your salvation until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. That is God's way of confirming that you are his child. It's the confirmation service. How do you know you've repented enough? How do you know you've believed enough? How do you know you've been properly baptized? When God confirms you. And that's what God's confirmation is. You cannot be 100% sure that he's accepted you until he gives you his spirit, pours his spirit into you and then you will know, you will be sure.